sound of a church or chapel bell. But I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. All right, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28, we're going to go through a couple of verses at the very beginning before the scene shifts. And so um, we're going to uh, look at um, something in the life of David, and then we're going to shift, and the entire rest of the chapter is going to look at the situation in the life of Saul. And David and Saul for many chapters now have been doing this cat and mouse kind of dance with one another where Saul out of jealousy and bitterness is pursuing David to kill him. And David is practicing great integrity on some level to resist the temptation to return the favor to Saul who is his king. Uh, but also demonstrating a great lack of integrity in other areas. And uh, such is the case with Christians oftentimes. You'll find this true in your own life. You'll have days where you're a stellar Christian doing what God wants and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're good on all accounts. And then you'll turn around the very next day and you'll fall apart and walk in the flesh and fail on every level. And it's very, very disappointing. And we see this out of David where one day he's acting as a godly man, as a kind of picture for us in the Old Testament of Jesus. And then on the very next chapter, we'll see him fall apart and represent something a little less holy than Jesus. Okay, So we're going to look at the first couple of verses and find out what's going on in David's life here. It says, Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And uh, Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go with me out to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. <clears throat> now, if you weren't with us for chapter 27, I'll give you a little bit of the backstory here that will kind of help to make sense of the first couple of verses that we just read. David is continually on the run from Saul. And of course, Saul is the king of Israel. And so David, to escape with his life, actually left Israel. And for those of you who are students of the Bible, you know that Israel is referred to as God's promised land. For generations before David was ever born, God promised David's ancestors that he would bring them into this land of their own as his promise and guarantee. So when they finally arrived, it was finally the fulfillment of this long conditioned promise that God had given to them uh, ages past. So it was a very glorious thing. When God makes a promise and that promise comes true, it's something to be cherished. When God makes a promise and that promise is fulfilled, it's something to be treasured. And David, in leaving Israel, for whatever it reason it may have been, is almost showing disdain for the promise that God gave him. He's left God's promise, left God's promised land. And if he's not in Israel, he's living somewhere else now. And it just so happens to be with the Philistines, who are perennial enemies of Israel, his own people. So David has defected to the enemy. He's living now with the Philistines, serving the Philistine king, Achish, and he has been living a lie, David has, and we learn this in chapter 27. He's living in enemy territory, serving an enemy king, and pretending as if he were being loyal to this king. The Bible tells us in chapter 27 that David would go out and make raids. In other words, he would attack neighboring villages. And what he would do is he would attack the villages that belonged under King Achish's jurisdiction. 
but when he came back and made a report of where he had attacked that day, he would lie to the king and tell him that he was actually attacking the villages of Israel, which, of course, Achish just ate that up because those are his enemies. And so, well, good for you, David. You're loyal to me. Well, David isn't loyal to him. David is lying. And so David has left the promise of God, and that's not good. He's living with the enemy and serving an enemy king and lying to him about it, and that's not good. So now you see out of David, this man who is just living a dual life, and this life of duality cannot be lived for very long as a, as a child of God before it catches up with you and corners you into a place that you'd rather not be. Okay, let me just bring this down to a very practical level. I'm speaking to you now in 2014. You in this room who would consider yourself to be Christian, yet live a double life. You claim to honor God, yet by your actions you've left his promises. You're serving an enemy king, living in enemy territory, living as if you had nothing to do with God, but you're living a life of duality, and it's not working there, and it's not working here, and sooner or later that double life will catch up to you. Mark my words. And some of you, I don't even need to say that because it already has. Some of you are living a secret life as a kind of double agent, and it will catch up to you. You can mark my words. This is biblical, and we're going to see this happening here in the life of David. His double life is now catching up to him. He's living a lie. And everything that I've said up to this point kind of clues us into the fact that his affections are for Israel. He's not living there, he's not serving there, but his affections are still there. Because he's still making raids on enemy communities in order to kind of help Israel. His heart's there, his affections are there. However, his loyalty has been given to the enemy king. So now he's divided. And when you're divided in such a way, sooner or later, your ultimate commitments have to fall on one side of the line or the other. And I would say this, your affections are no basis for your loyalty. If you think you're going to be loyal based on affection for something, it's not going to happen. We've all been affectionate for something that we ended up betraying. Maybe it was a spouse or a partner. We were affectionate for them. We were dating them. Until, of course, we got sick of them. Then we were on to somebody else. Maybe it's happened before in the marital realm. Maybe we've been there and got fed up with it and we're divorced now. Maybe it was with a, a, a place of work where when we first got the job, we were ecstatic. I got the job. And then pretty soon it just became a real trouble to us and we went on to other things. Some of us, we, we would say that we love Jesus. It's an affectionate kind of approach to Christ. We, we love him. We like him. We, we think he's great. But that's no basis for your loyalty. If it's affection only, what happens when the affections go away? I think it's a fair question. If your loyalty is based on affections, my goodness, what happens when the affections go away? Because they will. Anything right now that you like a lot is probably going to change in the next couple of years at least. I just, I love pepperoni pizza. Oh, but then that's all you eat and like you're not, I'm so sick of pepperoni pizza. I mean, our affections can change on a dime. And if they do, where, what, then will our loyalties go? Jesus says this. He says that without loyalty, we can't even claim to love him. Without loyalty, we may be affectionate as all get out for Jesus, but if we're, if we're not loyal, we, we can't claim to love him as we might say. He says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll obey me. Like Jesus says, love for me isn't the words you speak and it isn't the feelings you have, it's the actions you take. If you love me, you'll obey me. In 1 John 2, verses 4 and 6, John reports, whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar. The truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word, 
In him truly love is perfected. Whoever keeps God's word, in that person love is perfected. How's that for affections determined by where your loyalties are? The Bible tells us and warns us really that we can't align ourselves with sin or God's enemy. We cannot align ourselves with sin without actually becoming an enemy of God ourself. If you align yourself with sin, if you align yourself with what God opposes, if you align yourselves with all that's enemies of, of God and His kingdom, you automatically become God's enemy. It's in James 4.4. 4. He says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. He says, I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And you know what's tragic about these first couple of verses here is that, again, last time we met, we were talking about collateral damage, and I think that the whole crew was here last time. We were talking about how when you live in sin, as David is doing here, your sin has a way of kind of getting on other people, even though you may not have intended for it to spread that far. We called it collateral damage. That's damage done to, perhaps in a bombing situation, surrounding buildings that weren't the intended target. And we see this collateral damage happening further in David's life, where... He now, through his lying, is put into a position where he's going to be forced to fight against his own people in Israel. And did you notice that the king, Achish, said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out to me with battle, you and your men. So David's living a lie doesn't just force him into a bad spot where he has to go and fight against his own people, which I... I can guarantee you, was not in the plan when David defected to the Philistines. Never did he think that it would have gone so far that he would actually have to be forced into going back and fighting against his old classmates, his neighbors, perhaps relatives. He never thought that it would get that bad. Never was it in the plan to go and hurt those he loved, but it's going that route. And for the 600 men that are with him, it's happening to them too. They're now forced to go back and fight against the ones that they love. Their own countrymen. Sin works like that. The evil of sin is never satisfied to remain neutral. Okay? You can mark that down because it's a very fundamental truth of the Christian life. Sin is never content to remain neutral. It's progressive. Ultimately, it's going to force you into a decision, a place where you'll have to decide to actually begin destroying everything that's good in your life. Your sin will not remain neutral, but will, in time, force you to begin destroying everything that's good in your life. Again, we find this out the hard way all too often. When we went down the road of sin, we never thought that it would take us so far as to ruin things like the relationships that we had, our personal health. I didn't think I would lose my job because of it. I, I didn't think they'd kick me out of school. I didn't think that I'd lose my kids. But it did. And sin is never satisfied. Never satisfied. David is trying to play both sides, and it's not going to work, and sooner or later, he's going to find out the hard way that what Jesus said is true. You are either with me or you're against me. There's, again, no neutral. What that means, then, is that to not be with Jesus, to not be aligned with him, is to be opposed to him. It's to be his enemy. And if you're going to be against Jesus, you'll find that you're also against his people. 
So if you're not with Jesus, not only are you against Jesus, but you're also now against his people. What that says then is that if you are living as a double agent, playing both sides of the fence, though you sit in this room, you're opposed to us. You're against us. And you're against Jesus. You say, no, no, I love Jesus. Huh? Then why are you carrying on in it? Because he said, if you loved me, you'd be obeying me. You say, well, no, 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 no. I, I, we have a good relationship, me and God. He knows that I'm trying and I'm going to deal with this sooner or later. I'll get around to it. But the Bible says that you have become his enemy. So I hope you get around to it real quick. I hope you can walk away from sin and put it behind you and begin loving Jesus. David, however, he's not going to put this away just yet. We're going to shift the scene now, and it's kind of like a movie, right? Where you've got two plots going on simultaneously, and it's almost like the Dukes of Hazard if you go back that far. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, or like whatever, you know, and so the Duke boys are a hot pursuit of something else, and then the, the TV screen kind of flips, and then you're back somewhere, you know, in a uh, different part of the story. And so now it shifts in verse 3, and we, you know, back at the ranch, we're going to read about Saul's own little saga here. In verse 3, it says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. Now, Samuel was in Israel, and he functioned for many years as the prophet of Israel, as the spiritual leader of Israel. You could think of him as kind of like the pastor of the country. He was the man through whom God spoke. Very awesome man. It's the man after whom these books of the Bible are named, First and Second Samuel. He is a very prominent figure in Scripture. And if you want to go with me back to chapter 15 of First Samuel, you can page back there, and we're going to look at just a sample of the interaction that Samuel had with Saul before Samuel died. And their relationship was a pretty rocky relationship. It didn't get off on the right foot. Samuel was a man who loved God. And God came to Samuel one day and said, you know what, all the people of Israel want a king so that they can be like the uh, pagan nations around them. And Samuel, being a God-fearing, God-loving, God-honoring man, was like, that sucks. I don't want that to happen. And, and God said, slow down, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So let them have their king. So already Samuel's like, I don't like this at all. But God says, no, do it. Let them have their king. So then Samuel goes and he finds the king that God has chosen. He's a tall, dark, handsome man. And he's elected by the people based primarily upon his looks. And Samuel from the very get-go is already approaching this with kind of a bitter taste in his mouth. He tells all the people, hey, uh, here's the king you wanted. Life's going to suck from now on. And then he says to the king, you suck, you know, basically. Uh, and so then their, their relationship was kind of, shall we say, tumultuous from there forward. And in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, we read a little bit about the kind of relationship that they had. And it says here in verse, or, uh, chapter 15, let's see if I can find it here. We'll start in verse 2. No, we'll just start in the very beginning here. So Samuel also said to Saul in verse 1, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Okay, so now the word of the Lord is, is being spoken through Samuel, who is the prophet, and he tells Saul, listen, this is what God told me, you're supposed to go and utterly destroy Amalek and all of his community, his people, enemy nation, 
all the men and the women and the babies and the donkeys and the camels and the sheep, wipe them out altogether. So in verse 4, Saul gathered all the people together, numbered them, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. And I'll just cut to the chase here. They went up and they fought against Amalek. Now jump ahead to verse 10 of our chapter there in chapter 15, and it says, The word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. H how do you like that? What if God called you to something, and then later on went, I really regret doing that. I mean, that would be like, I don't know what would happen to me if all of a sudden I, I got word that God was really sorry that he ever made me pastor. I'd be like, <laughs> really? Like, does that mean I don't get any help anymore? Like, it's just me? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know what would happen. Well, this is God speaking to Samuel, expressing regret, great regret that he set Saul up as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So you can tell that this is a man of God. He's grieved, and he's just laying in bed crying all night about the fact that this has gone so horribly wrong, as God said it was going to from the beginning. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went up to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Saul thinks he's a really big deal. Because when you start making sculptures of yourself, you think you're a big deal. Just that's how that works. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? I've performed the, the commandment of the Lord. Oh, really? Because the commandment of the Lord was to kill everything, including the donkeys, including the cows. And what's this that I'm hearing? I, sounds like livestock to me. Liar. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we've utterly destroyed. And then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, which is Bible for shut up, right? You get that? You get, Samuel is not happy. So I don't think it was, be quietest, bow. It was more like, shut up. <laughs> he says, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. Again, that's Bible for, okay. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Like God did something awesome for you. And he goes, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're consumed. Why then didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, oh, but I've obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Am Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen and all that. He says, they did it. It wasn't me. So Samuel, if you look at verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now there, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, this is important. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned around to go away. Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. He ripped his robe. Get it? So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. When he says strength of Israel, he's talking of God. He goes, and God is not going to relent. God, he's not going to change his mind. So Samuel leaves Saul with this. You just tore my robe. God just tore the kingdom away from you, and he's going to give it to somebody else. And by the way, God is never, ever, ever going to change his mind on that. Flip back to chapter 28. We'll keep reading in verse 3. Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him, and they buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land.
This is an interesting tidbit here, isn't it? Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Mediums and spiritists. These are like fortune tellers, crystal ball reading people. They're expressly forbidden in scripture from being allowed to live in the community of God's people. Very strict rules governed that practice. They were to be put to death. They were to be absolutely rejected. The land was to be cleansed of them. And so here we see that Saul had actually done that. He kicked them out of the country. Now, I want to say this. We've seen so much evil in Saul, it's hard to kind of reconcile the fact that he used to do good godly things like this. I mean, the Bible told him to get rid of all of the fortune tellers or necromancers. That's what that's called when you talk to dead people, necromancy. And he did. But there's other such diabolical evil things that Saul has done. You've got to wonder, what was the deal? Why is he sometimes doing what's right and then sometimes doing what's terribly wrong? I have a... suspicion, if you will, I guess a, I think it's a, an educated opinion on this. Being the fact that Samuel, the prophet, was such a strong leader, I think that he was very influential. And I would go so far as to say that Saul really admired Samuel and was probably inspired by his leadership and passion. Probably Samuel had such a character that Saul thought, you know what, I'd like to be like that. I want to be godly too. Saul's early religious fervor in casting out all the mediums and the spiritists may have been nothing more than an attempt to impress Samuel. I've known people like this. I say this because I've known people like this. They all of a sudden act really religious and really holy when they're around an impressive godly character. You give a person, a strong, godly leader, and suddenly they'll begin doing things not because it says so in the Bible, not because they truly love Jesus, but because they want to impress that godly man. And I have a strong suspicion that Saul was one of those who wanted to impress his leaders. Now, if, if that's right, it only makes sense that once Samuel is out of the picture, Saul would begin to demonstrate a different character altogether. He's holy and godly when Samuel's around, but when Samuel's out of the picture, boy, the guy looks like the devil incarnate. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we read about this, how Saul's religious performance was often contingent upon whether or not Samuel was present. You guys may have remembered the uh, account where Saul was kind of waiting for Samuel to return after a week of absence so that he could sacrifice on the altar. And Samuel delayed in his arrival, and so Saul took it upon himself to go and do it him by, by himself, which was a huge no-no, and got himself into a fair amount of trouble with Samuel. Because Samuel didn't like it when people didn't do things God's way, and so Saul was on the receiving end of some strong rebuke. Some people fall into the trap like this of living double lives where when they're around a godly leader, they feign holiness. They pretend to be holy. But then when they're not any longer in the presence of the godly leader or that godly influence, they go right back to the way that they always were. Psalm 81 verse 15 is an interesting take on this, it says, those who hate the Lord pretend submission. Or why don't we just shorten it and say, those who hate the Lord pretend. They pretend. They pretend what? They pretend that they don't hate the Lord. Those who hate the Lord pretend they don't. Those who hate the Lord pretend they love him. Those who hate the Lord and rebel against him pretend that they don't rebel at all. And so they will feign acts of holiness and religious devotion and all the rest, particularly in situations when godly people are watching. 
But when no one's watching, they go back to their sane behaviors. It's those who live without the reassurance of the Holy Spirit who make religious attempts at getting the approval from men. If you're not getting your assurance from God, if, if you don't have that feeling of God's acceptance, you're going to look for it elsewhere. And Saul has been looking for it from Samuel all this time because he's not getting it from God. And hopefully he can get it from Samuel. Tragedy is he ain't getting it from Samuel either. And when you don't get approval from God, and so you work hard to find approval from godly people, and you can't find it there either, now you're at a real loss because everybody needs approval. Drive you crazy if you don't have it. We're all looking for approval. It's true. Down to even the most mundane things that we do throughout the day. The way we dress, most of us, some of us were exempt from this, but most of us, we dress to please, to a certain extent. The way we trim our hair, the makeup we wear, the shoes we buy, the way we talk, the way we present ourselves. Smiles and handshakes and what's up, bro? We want approval. And if we don't have it, nothing like continual disapproval on all fronts to drive somebody nuts. These people who live without the approval of God are going to clamor for approval and acceptance from spiritual leadership because it quiets their uneasy conscience. If you can find approval from spiritual leadership, even as a God-rejecting unbeliever, it actually helps. So you're living your life in rejection of Jesus, but you have approval from, say, a pastor or a preacher. That'll do a world of wonders for you because it helps you to feel a little bit better. And these types of people are some of the hardest working. I mean, they are some of the best ones to have at church because they can get the most done. But the tragedy is, is that they're working to buy approval from those they know are watching. And they're looking for approval from those around them because they're not getting it from God. And that's the saddest of all. They're some of the hardest working people you'll ever meet, but they have no peace at all. Matthew 6, 1, Jesus warns us, saying, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Be careful of that, guys. And if that's you, you got to just take a good look at why you're doing it. Motives are the... the that's the issue. Are you doing things to find the approval of men? Of the people around you? We ought to be finding our approval from God. In verse 4 it says, Then the Philistines gathered together, and they came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord didn't answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Urim are kind of like dice. They used to roll dice to find out the will of God. We don't have to do that anymore, by the way. So if you're one of those, you know, like kind of superstitious types, um, don't, don't bother. In verse 7 it says, Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Now I'll say this. Whether Saul had gotten rid of all of the necromancers in the land because the Bible told him to, and by the way, the Bible did tell him to in Deuteronomy and Leviticus both, whether he was getting rid of them all in obedience to the Bible or in an attempt to impress Samuel, it doesn't really matter anymore. It's all for naught. Because now, those very spiritists that he kicked out, he's going to them now for help. It's just crazy how all of this religious devotion, in the end, got him nowhere. He's actually going back on it all. In verse 6, you'll notice that God is no longer listening to Saul. Oh, bad day. He's praying to God, and God isn't listening. We need to be reminded of one sobering truth before we go any further, and it's this. God isn't obligated to listen to anybody. Okay? 
So when you get all frustrated with him that he's not answering my prayers, hey, cool off, because he doesn't have to. God's not obligated to listen to anybody. The fact that he does is a demonstration of mercy. He does listen, even though he's not obligated to. That is what we would call mercy. And as far as God's listening to prayers is concerned, he seems to reserve his speaking for those who will actually listen when he speaks. That's how God does it. You know, I mean, I'll talk to you for so long, but if you're not listening, eventually I'll quit talking to you. Right? Kind of a waste of my time. It'd be a waste of your time if you're trying to have a conversation with me and I'm in la-la land, right? So if God is going to speak to you, he's doing so with the assumption that you'll listen when he speaks. And if you won't, might I suggest that he may just quit speaking. And some of us have gone so long without listening that either our ears have become deaf to his screams or he's just not talking anymore. In John 9, verse 31, it says, God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Saul has what I would call selective hearing. He'll hear God when he wants to hear God, but then he'll ignore God when he doesn't want to hear what God just said. Mm, that's bad. You know, it's just not healthy. Because God is going to say some things that we don't want to hear. Would you agree with me if I said that? I just did say it. Do you agree? He's going to say some things sometimes that we don't want to hear. Growing up, mom and dad said things to me as a, as a child that I didn't want to hear, right? Stuff like go clean your room, go brush your teeth. Remember, I hated that stuff. But they said it anyway. Whether I wanted to hear it or not because it was good for me. And God will tell you what's good and right. Sometimes you won't want to hear it. But we ought to listen regardless. If we start practicing selective hearing, we can certainly get ourselves in trouble. Here's how Proverbs chapter 1 puts it. Because I have called and you have refused, God says, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and you would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. I don't want to get myself in that spot. Do you? Do you know that you can get yourself in that spot? Simply by ignoring God. Simply by ignoring him when he speaks. And guys, how does God primarily speak? Primarily through his word. So if it's biblical, I suggest you listen. If it's biblical and it can be proven in scripture, I suggest you listen. How else does God speak? He speaks through people. He speaks through godly counsel. He speaks through godly friends. He speaks through Christians. He chooses to work that way. And if what they're saying is biblical, strongly suggest you listen because to ignore them is to ignore God because it's coming from God's word. Some people want to know so badly what God's saying to them. My answer is, if you want to know what God is saying to you now, pay attention to what he's already told you in the past. He said a lot. What's God saying to you? Ah, page after page after page of stuff. Read it and then you'll know what he's saying. And when he speaks, please listen. That's for your own good. In verse 8, it says, So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. He's wearing a disguise. I would just, in passing, say that those who walk in the truth have no need to wear a mask, but Saul isn't walking in the truth, so he has to put on a costume. John 3.20 says, All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. This is Saul. He just doesn't want to be found out. He's doing what's wrong. He's always been doing what's wrong, and now he has to go incognito. He's probably wearing the Richard Nixon mask. Or the scream mask. 
Verse 9 says, Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done. So she has no idea that it's Saul she's talking to. You know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? So she's practicing her profession very covertly because she doesn't want to be found out. If she's found out, she's going to die. And Saul swore to her by the Lord. How do you like that? He swore, I swear to you in Jesus' name. What a joker. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. I just think it's interesting that he's swearing to her in the name of the Lord. I mean, this is just ridiculous that he's going to a necromancer for counsel at all. I mean, he's so far from the Lord and has alienated himself so badly from the community of God that there's nobody else in his life that he can get wise counsel from. He has to go to somebody who should have been put to death for her sin. Man, this is like, man, I got, I got real marriage problems. I, I'm going to, you know, I, I, just, I just don't know what to do about it. Maybe Elizabeth Taylor could help me on this. You're like, are you kidding me? She's been divorced how many times? Double digits, I think. It's like, get real. Couldn't you find somebody better? But Saul is going now to a necromancer. Let's talk to dead people and see if we can't figure this crap out. Really? How far you fallen, Saul? Used to be a spirit-filled man. Used, used to be a, a, a chosen by God leader of Israel. No trace of integrity is left. Nothing. All of his former religious devotion is now proven worthless by the fact that he basically is throwing it all away as if it means nothing to him. And I will tell you, based on first-hand experience, that I have seen some people serve the Lord for many, many years, upwards of a decade and a half, and throw it all away as if they had never done any of it. Living in sin, walking away, not serving the Lord, not caring for God's people, walking away from Jesus altogether. It's like they spent the last 15 years of their life in a coma. It's just gone. Just absolutely vanished. Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel puts it this way. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies in it, it's because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. You spend many years of your life serving the Lord and you know you were a Sunday school teacher and you did a missions trip and you, you used to do all this and that in the church and you did all that and the Bible says that if you want to just walk away from it all and you go live the rest of your life in sin, what does that count for? Any of it. What good was any of it? It's interesting to me that this woman here has a profession that's sustained by continual rebellion against God. In order for her to sustain the profession that she's chosen, she has to live in continual rebellion against God's word. And then you have a man, Saul, whose life and character have been confirmed to be one of the God-rejecting kind, and yet the oath between them is made in the name of the same Lord that they're both rejecting. She hates God enough to live in continual sin and disobedience. He hates God enough to go and do what is wrong in his eyes. And yet the oath between them, the common ground that they have, is the Lord. Does that sit funny with anybody else? I mean, I just, it blows my mind that some people want nothing of the Lord. Nothing of the Lord, until, of course, invoking his name could maybe get them what they want. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, praise Jesus. Yeah. You know, you know she's going to break up with you if you're not a Christian, so you better act Christian. And there's just a million reasons to lie and bring the name of the Lord into the situation to kind of coat things over and keep you from being found out. In verse 11, the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And Saul said, Bring up Samuel for me, 
When the woman when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. <laughs> so I don't know if she was a fraud or what, but you know, maybe this was the first time she actually made contact with a dead guy. And she's like, Whoa! <laughs> She cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. So apparently Samuel comes up out of the dead and sees this woman and goes, By the way, that's Saul. And she's like, what? And then now she, I mean, how do you like that? Some guy comes back from the dead and tells on you. <laughs> like, you know, that would be bad. So she cries out with a loud voice and she says, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle, meaning a robe. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and doesn't answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. That kills me. What I should do. What should I do now? What you should do is reverse time by a couple decades and begin obeying the Lord 20 years ago. What should I do? It's too late now. I mean, you've been rejecting God for how long, Saul? And now you want to know what you should do? A little too late. Maybe you should have thought about that before you got into this mess. What should I do? In verse 16, Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. In chapter 15, For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. When Samuel says to Saul, tomorrow you will be with me, you and your sons, he doesn't mean in heaven, he means dead. Saul will not go to heaven. That's the assumption that we can make based on everything that we read in the Bible, both of his own personal account and everything else that God says of righteousness in Scripture. He is not going to be with him in heaven. He's going to die tomorrow. And I find this ironic because you remember when we flip back to chapter 15 and Saul was supposed to utterly destroy the Amalekites and kill all the donkeys and kill Amalek and all of these people, and he didn't? And Samuel said to him then, 15 years ago, exactly what he's telling him now. Same thing. God has rejected you. He's become your enemy. He's torn your kingdom out of your hands and has given it to somebody else. It's the same message that Saul got from Samuel 15 years earlier. You know why? Because God's word doesn't change. It never changes. And do you remember in chapter 15 and verse 25, Samuel ended his rebuke with, and God will not relent. He's never, ever going to change his mind. Even if I die and you bring me back from the dead, I'm going to tell you the same thing. You know the truth is the truth when somebody comes back from the dead and it's the same message they preached when they were alive. Jesus Christ preached on this earth for many years great truths that are still true today after he came back from the dead. The message doesn't change. But those who hear it don't always believe. And it's interesting 
because Jesus said, while he was alive, in Luke 16, 31, he said to the Pharisees, by the way, he said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen even if someone rises from the dead. And then Jesus promptly died on a cross, came back three days later, and kept preaching the same message, only to prove to the Pharisees that rejected him that what he said while he was first alive was true. He came back from the dead. He told them the truth, and even though someone came back from the dead to tell them, they still wouldn't believe. And here now you've got Samuel, how many years before Jesus even showed up, doing the same thing, comes back from the dead, tells Saul what he already told Saul, the very same unchanging truth. And by the way, when it says that he came up out of the ground with a mantle, it's the same word in the original he Hebrew language as in chapter 15 when it says that Saul tore his robe. The word robe and the word mantle are the same, and it's likely that what Saul is seeing Samuel wearing is that same robe that he tore. And so Samuel comes out of the grave and lifts up his robe and says, I already told you, do you remember? God tore the kingdom out of your hand and you're done. It's over. God's never-changing truth, it won't change for anyone. In verse 20, Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or night. Makes sense to me. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he heeded their voice, and he arose from the ground and sat on his bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it. She took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate, and they rose, and went away that night. This is the last supper for Saul. He's going to die tomorrow. Final meal. And it's given to him at the hands of a woman who should have already been taken care of. She has been living in continual rejection of God and God's word. Saul is a similar, of similar nature, living in rejection of God and God's word. And he finds comfort from her. His last meal is prepared by this woman who likewise hates God. How fitting. How fitting for a man who in his life found no approval from God, sought approval from godly people, found no approval from them, sought approval from those around him and could never do it. And so in the end, in the very end, the only one that he can find comfort, approval, reassurance from, is a God-rejecting, rebellious woman who has nothing to do with God. Where do you find your approval from? Do you have the approval of God? Do you live with the full understanding and the peace that comes along with feeling God's approval? Because if you don't, you're likely to try and find it then from godly leaders. It just kind of goes down that road naturally. We see it in Saul's life. We'll look to impress others with our religious performance. And if they don't buy it, where are you going to turn? You're going to try and find it somewhere else. And ultimately, you're going to go down the road where you'll only find acceptance with sinners. You'll leave everything that God has ever given you. You will abandon the church, you will run from God's people, you'll be left with nothing, and you'll be desperately trying to find approval with those who want nothing to do with God. And I say this both as biblical instruction, but I also say this from experience. I've seen it happen. People have come even into these doors trying hard to impress and it didn't work, and they leave bitter, and they leave feeling guilty, and they desperately look for approval from others, 
And when they can't find it there, they go right back into the same life that they were ever living because that's where they can find approval. It's tragic. It's tragic, but it has to be reported because God gave us the account of Saul in the Bible. Apparently, he wants us to see the account of this ugly king and be forewarned that if we're not right with God through Christ, we're not going to find approval with God. And guys, if we don't have approval with God, we're going to start doing some pretty crazy things to find it because remember, everybody wants to have approval. We'll go to drastic measures to find approval. Saul never, never would have thought that he'd be gone this far, calling up dead people from the grave in order to find help. Can't find it from him, and now he has yoked himself with this woman who deserves to die. And Saul is going to be the one who, within 24 hours, is in this grave. Well, I would invite you tonight, if you don't know much about, and I believe that this room is full of people who kind of get it. They, they have some, you know, you've got some Bible knowledge, both those at my church and those of you who are at uh, downtown there. We know the verses, but we do, do, I would have to go further than that and ask you if you know the God behind the verses. Well, sure, I, I, I know him. Okay, then do you love him? Yeah, I like him. I think he's awesome. Jesus is cool. Do you love him? You remember what I mean by love? Jesus defined it as obedience. Is there this desire in you to follow his will and to please him? Is there just this overriding desire and passion for him? Or is it feigned? Are we trying to impress someone around us? Whether it be some authority in the courts or some authority at a program or some authority in this church or some authority, somebody... Guys, to seek the approval of men is a very short road, and it ends in disaster. Seek the approval of God. You can know Him and feel His approval of you. And if you have the approval of God, the Bible would indicate that we have no need.